Well, you guys ready to get into the Word this morning? So uh, let's go to Romans chapter 1. And so for those who are visiting for the first time today, my name is John. I'm the lead pastor here at the Gathering Place Church. Love this place, love these people, and love the fact that you are visiting us today. There's a guest card in your bulletin. You can fill that out, drop it in the GPC box. Out those doors to the left, you'll see a pretty box called GPC. And drop your uh, guest card in there. You'll get a free book. Um, the God Questions, the six most asked questions about God. Great answers in that book. Uh, but we'd also have a record of your stay, any prayer needs you might have. So this morning, uh, we're jumping into part two of the book of Romans. During the summer, we're going through the book of Romans. So when people are traveling and on vacation, we can all still stay connected in community as we're all going through the same book together. So Mark launched uh, the book of Romans last week. Thank you, Mark. Or no, two weeks ago. Last week was Father's Day. And Jesse knocked it out of the park, bringing us a Father's Day message. Thank you, Jesse. I loved Father's Day this year more than any other Father's Day ever in my entire life because I had Father's Day for 36 hours. It began in India, and as you come this direction, the sun doesn't set. And so it was the longest Father's Day of my life. So Romans chapter 1, here's what I'm going to do today. It's going to be a miraculous feat. I'm going to cover three chapters in one message. Everybody say, Godspeed. We're going to be here until 3 p.m., but that's all right. You guys are okay with that, right? So Romans chapter 1. The reason I want to jump back into Romans chapter 1 is because the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, as I'm sure Mark uh, covered, uh, describes the downward spiral of the human race when we disconnect from God. And the first disconnection you find in the book of Romans is losing our thankfulness as he is our creator. It's the first thing the Apostle Paul says is they were not thankful. Once we lose our thankfulness, you unhitch from the creator and it begins this downward spiral into the futility of mind and debauchery. And so that thankfulness piece is so important. But I'm not gonna get dark on Romans chapter one. I'm sure Mark covered that downward spiral with you last week. What I love what the Holy Spirit did in the book of Romans, he opened the book with the answer to the problem. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Let's look at this together. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Well, I'm in the book of Matthew, so let me catch up to you guys. Romans chapter 1. Is that in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Help me. Somebody. All right, here we go. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The Apostle Paul says this. Let's read this out loud together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first to Jew and also the Greek. Now, in our day and age, our society, with our PC culture, this all-inclusive, love means permissiveness, culture that we're in, they are defining the good news as what? Bad news. Because it's exclusive. Jesus says, I'm the only way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is a confrontational message going cross grain to our current culture where all roads lead to God. Now, we covered that in one of our past series about do all roads really lead to God in the God Question series. So you can uh, listen to that sermon online. But the reality is, the gospel is the good news. Because the world is under a terrible plight, a massive identity crisis. Jesus calls us lost sheep. The good news is that God has given us a way out through his son. But isn't it interesting that in this verse, the apostle Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, says, I am not ashamed. The definition of to be ashamed is embarrassed or guilty due to one's actions, characteristics, or associations. Reluctant to do something through fear of embarrassment or humiliation. Like sharing the gospel. 
The persecution we have in this culture is not the same as the culture we just came from where they are kicked out of their village, they are beaten, they are tortured, they're imprisoned, and they are martyred. In our culture, we don't experience that yet. What we experience is being shamed. Shame on you for calling sin, sin. You bigoted haters. You narrow-minded, closed-minded, judgmental Christians. Shame on you. And so what is the motivation of shame? What is shame trying to do to the follower of Christ? Shut your mouth. Don't you dare share the gospel, you hater. Now, who do you think, now, if the gospel truly is the hope of the world, who do you think is behind that shame? Certainly, the father of lies, Satan himself, who wants to take all of humanity with him, but Christ came so that everyone, the scripture said, everyone who believes will be saved. But the only way people will be saved is if they hear. And the only way they will hear is if someone is sent. And the only way somebody will sin is if God sends them. And God has sent every single believer, every single follower of Christ has been sent the day they were born again. You know, it's interesting. When I was in India, the way that we did this was we went into a home where there were no Christians. And the next week, we'll give a, a nice report. We'll have pictures and, and some uh, testimonies. But just briefly, we'd go into a home. It was, it was all Hindus. We would share the gospel with them. Many of them would get saved. Then we'd say, okay, now we're going to teach you how to share the gospel. And we did. Then we sent them out, said, we'll wait in your home for an hour and wait for you to come back. They'd come back with people they led to the Lord. Then we come back the next day, they're waiting for us with more people that they had led to the Lord. And when we saw like this one gal, this one lady, these two teenage girls, they went out to share the God. They had just got saved 15 minutes earlier. They went out. They brought back an itinerant uh, businesswoman. She goes from village to village selling these bracelets. They led her to Christ. We laid hands on her, and she starts weeping. She's sitting on the floor in this, in this real tiny home, concrete floor. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, if you've ever been in the third world. And we're laying hands on her. She's weeping. We said, what do you feel on the inside? She goes, I feel such love on the inside of me. Well, that's Romans 5.5, 5, how the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our hearts the love of God. Then the next day we came back, and this itinerant uh, saleswoman led somebody else to the Lord. What is this? Well, what's the Bible say? The scripture we just read. The gospel is the power of God. It is. Not your personality, not your delivery, not your education. The gospel message is the power of God to salvation. When we invite people to receive Jesus, we do not invite them to join a club. We don't invite them to join a religion. We're not inviting them to join our church. We are inviting them to have a divine, supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ himself by the power of his Holy Spirit, the only one who can go inside the human soul and by the power of God, make a new creation that never existed before. It is a miracle. The greatest miracle this side of heaven is the new birth. No man, no woman, no counselor, no drugs, no degree, no amount of money can create the new birth. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Now, this word power, look at this. There's four different power words in the Bible. One is exousia, which is delegated authority. The other one is iskuros, which is great physical strength. The other one is kratos, which is dominion and authority. But this one used in Romans 1.16 is dunamis, energy, might great force, great ability, dynamite. That's where we get the word dynamite from. And what does this dynamite do? It brings salvation. This word salvation is soteria. Now let's see if the definition definition of salvation is good news or bad news. Look at this definition. Deliverance, preservation, soundness, prosperity, happiness, rescue, general well-being, both in material 
temporal sense and spiritual eternal sense. Now leave that up for a second. I want to ask you, how many people do you know that are looking for deliverance, preservation, soundness, prosperity, happiness, rescue, general well-being, both in a material, temporal sense and spiritual, eternal sense? How many of you know someone looking for something on that board right there? Like the entire human race. And honestly, you and I as well. We have to keep going back to the same source. You know, this morning I woke up, I was, I was groggy, I was foggy, I was, felt a little oppressed, I was tired from the trip, I've had a long week coming back from India, I haven't got much sleep, my cat, I have heard one of my kids knocking at the door this morning at 4.30 a.m. and I needed a good night's sleep so badly, I jump up out of bed, I'm thinking, what, something's wrong, and I open it up and it's our cat with his little mouse toy wanting to play. That was unhelpful. So I was up till four, at 4.30, up 2.30 the night before. I need sleep. I, I'm thinking, God, I got to come to church this morning. I need to lead your people. I need to serve them well. I need to preach well. I need to inspire and encourage. But man, I don't know. I feel, I don't have, I, I'm, I don't have it today. Help me. So I just thought, I'm just going to worship. I'm just going to sit here for a moment. I'm going to love on Jesus. You need to do something in me. Holy Spirit, come. Touch my heart. Fill me with your spirit. It took about 30 seconds, and all of a sudden, this hope came into me, and this clarity of mind came into me, and this faith rose in me, this inspiration. I mean, I just stood up and started pacing back and forth in my living room, and it was like, it was off. All that was off of me, and I was in a completely different place, and I said, Jesus, I cannot count how many times in the last 30 years you've done that for me, and I thought, what do people do that don't have this source to tap into? Or Christians that don't know how to do it. They don't have a prayer life. They don't know to just stop and connect with God and how to connect with God. What do you do without the divine source to tap into? It's the power of God to salvation, which isn't just eternal life. It's preservation, soundness, prosperity, happiness, rescue, and the rest. Now, here's the bad news. Jesus has left it up to you and I to spread this good news. Now, why do I call that bad news? When I was over with Kumar, this apostle, who has planted over 600,000 house churches in 12 different countries. He was a Hindu priest. Jesus appears to him, takes him to heaven. He's ready to go in, and Jesus says, you can't come in. You've got to go tell people about me. So he spent the, the, the last, I don't know, 20-some years of his life going, to, going all over the place, teaching people about Christ and planting churches. When I mentioned to him, and he's, he and I are working together in Bella, we're, th we're working together. These new believers, they get born again, we send them out within 15 minutes of being saved, we teach them how to lead people to Christ, which most believers don't know how. And I don't say that to be shameful, I say that because it's a fact, and it's horrible, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe it. But they won't believe it if they're not told the message. It would be like somebody buying you an, a, a, an extremely expensive Christmas gift. And they put it in the mail. But you never get it. Because the mailman doesn't know how to deliver mail. You say, well, that's ridiculous. Exactly. I told Kumar after we sent them out. And then these new believers came back and had people saved within... 30 minutes to a half hour, or to an hour. I said to Kumar, do you know in America, less than 2% of believers share their faith? He looked at me like somebody had slapped him in the face with a brick. He could not believe what I was saying. And I said, unless I've led people to the Lord. So coming back here, I thought, you know, this is just unacceptable. The gospel message is so simple. It's so simple that it's a, the Bible says it's a, it's, it's a, um, no, it's foolishness to the intellectuals. The message is so simple. It's foolishness to intellectuals. Oh yeah, you believe in a real Adam and Eve? Uh-huh, so did Jesus, so did Paul, so did Luke who wrote the book of Acts. They all believed in a literal Adam and Eve. And you believe in the Garden of Eden? Mm -hmm, yeah, the Son of God did too. And you believe he died for our sins, rose from the dead? Yep. And you believe he's coming back for his believers? Yep. 
That's the whole gospel message right there. I do believe that. It's foolishness to intellectuals who put their faith in their intellect. It is a stumbling block for religious people because religion is us trying to work our way to God. Where the gospel is God worked his way down to us because we were never going to make it to him on our own good works. So it's offensive to religious people who feel like they've been working their whole life doing these good deeds and they can't wait to get to heaven to impress God. But the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, this message is so simple to share that I'm going to have my 17-year-old daughter come up right now and teach us how to share the gospel. You guys ready? Okay, now, here's your assignment. Please open up your bulletins, and in your bulletins, you have two three-by-five cards. We're going to do a little workshop this morning. It's not just preaching. We're going to do a little work. If the person next to you does not have a bulletin, so they do not have a three-by-five card, I put two three-by-five cards in your bulletin so you can share one with the person next to you. If you still don't have a three-by-five card then you can raise your hand and an usher will rush to your seat with a three by five card. And if you don't have a writing utensil, they even have sharpened pencils for you. We are going to learn this morning how to share the gospel. You guys ready? Are right, you ready? Is it on? Is it working? Okay, we are going to do this for 10 minutes. So, First, Bella is going to show you. Then, after she shows you, you're going to turn to the person next to you, and you are going to do this with the person next to you. The middle schoolers are doing the same thing right now. This church is going to learn how to share the gospel. Amen? All right, here we go. Bells. Is she on? Let's try this one more time. So we got, we're on, and hang on. Well, that's on, and try that now. Morning, everyone. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, so you start off with, in the beginning, there was God. And God created all things. He created the sun and the moon and the stars and the plants and all the animals. And then... The last thing he created was man. And you say, God loved man very much. And the purpose of him creating man was so he could have a relationship. But then man sinned, which separated man from God's holiness. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And then I just sometimes leave it there at that. No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> no, you got to finish it. Wow. But. <laughs> Guess who she takes after. Yeah, you, you said it before I said it. But. It's an ornery. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's the gospel message. Boom! Okay, now, please write the scripture references down where they belong on there, okay? Turn to the person next to you and do it just like she did it to the person next to you. Then after you do it, then it's the other person's turn. Let's do it quickly. Come on. If you need it, everybody's going to do this or you're going to hell. Okay, ushers, if you need a three by five card or a pencil, raise your hand and they will rush down. You got to learn how to lead somebody to Jesus. The world needs the gospel message. It is the power of God. Now, as everybody's turning and obeying the pastor this morning, I want to talk to those of you that are listening online or watching online. Maybe you don't know the gospel. Maybe you've never heard this before. But I want to say to you that you will never make it to heaven by being a good person. 
The Bible very clearly says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But the good news is God loves you. He loves you so much. He knows you. He knows you by name. He, he came to the earth himself in the form of a man named Jesus, the Son of God. He lived the perfect life in your place. Then he died in your place by taking the penalty of your sin upon himself, all because of his love for you. Then he rose from the dead, and he waits at the right hand of the Father for you to hear the gospel message which you're hearing right now. And right where you are, if you would receive him, just say, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior for the forgiveness of my sins. Immediately, he will forgive you, breathe the Spirit into you. You'll be what Jesus called born again. You will feel his peace immediately. And you'll become a child of God. You can do that right now where you are. I want to pray this prayer with you while the rest of the congregation is learning how to share the gospel. Just say this, say, Jesus, I receive you right now as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit. I want to live with you for the rest of my life. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I guarantee you that Jesus is going to prove himself to you over the next weeks, months, and years. And you'll know that this prayer was the real deal. Okay. How many of you have not yet done the chart? Raise your hand. You have not yet done the I chart. I don't want to assume Okay. Question. So everybody, okay, everybody, okay, who's lying? Raise your hand if you're lying. Is that that a okay. Genderless Look at your fingertips and see if they're turning Gender white. Neutral. Gender All right. fluid. Yeah. Okay, now, I'm real bold. Let him decide Who in the house? Oh, okay. Probably. Now, we're doing with you just like we did with the people in India, and they did it. We're talking about kids and teenagers and people from 9 to 99. So, who will run up here real quick and be bold enough to do this? Come on, somebody, run up here real quick because I've got to cover two more chapters in about 15 minutes. So I don't have time to wait. Come on up here. Somebody going to share the gospel. Here we go. Who's coming? I'll do it. Huh? Come on. No. Come on. Somebody come up. You got to repeat what she just did. You're going to come. You're going to like, this is going to be a drag of a day because right now I'm just going to stand there until somebody comes up here and boldly does the bridge. All right. Melissa Morris. Here we go. You don't, you don't have to use the scriptures uh, if you don't remember where they go, but knowing you, you probably do. But, okay, here we go. And we're going to grade you too. No kidding. Oh, no. Well, uh, oh, yeah. Hey, I'll hold it. You draw, and I'll be your mic holder. Here we go. Well, oh, you're going to do that? Okay. What's up? Here we go. Let me turn this on. Yeah. Okay, now you can't use the cheat sheet. Here you go. So, you know, we all have our weakness, and I know a lot of scripture, but I can't put the reference to it. Sorry. So I'm going to call on you each time, and you'll be my crutch, okay? All right. So here we go. So I bet your dad could do it too, but I have faith in you. Okay. And they say that to learn something better, you have to teach it. That's right. So there you go. All right. So I'm going to repeat exactly what I learned to the best of my ability. So God, in the beginning, created everything the heavens and the earth and the plants and the animals and everything cool in creation. And then on the last day, he created the most important thing, which was man. He had created everything for man. I'm embellishing a little, I'm sorry, but I'm not a very good artist. He needs, really short. Oh, that's not, he needs prayer. <laughs> hey, he's armed. You know. <laughs> God doesn't love you more if your arms are the same length. Okay, so. <clears throat> and he created man to enjoy all of creation, but most importantly, to be in relationship with him. So that was his design, is for us to have a relationship. But man sinned, and he broke relationship with God. So now there is a separation between man and God. Yeah. And in the word, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Good. And Bella said that that is? Romans 3.23. This is because I was never in Awana that I can't put them together. Okay. 
So, got a lot of scripture in here, but not the verses. <clears throat> so here's fire, which is the separation from God. It's the fire of hell. It's being separate from God. And so that was our fate because of what we did. But God, in the Bible it says, for God lo so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. I did get that one. Boom. <clears throat> and he sent him down to earth to die on a cross to bridge the gap Boom. that man had created. And when he bridged that gap, that gave us hope. Yay! And the hope is that we can live now with God eternally if we believe in the one who bridged the gap, who is Christ. Amen! <laughs> Boom! Oh, thank you. We have to erase the damnation now. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay, now listen, you can do that. Here, here's your pen. You can do that on a napkin at a restaurant. You can do it on an airplane. You can do it in the sand at the beach. You can share that gospel, that simple gospel message with anybody, anywhere. And I can't, there are so many different places I've shared that simple message. And I'll tell you, it seems so simple, it seems silly. But that's the point. Jesus made it so simple that they that believe the simple gospel message, the power of God causes them to be born again. So let's get up from 2% to like 102%. How about that? Sharing the gospel. It's all of our responsibility. Okay, now, chapter two. And I gotta move quickly. Chapter two. This message is called Two Don'ts and One Do. The first don't was don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't let the devil shut your mouth. Share the gospel. It's the most loving thing you will ever do on earth is sharing the good news of Jesus. Don't worry about the ramifications because in heaven, you'll be thanked by those that you shared the gospel with. Number two, the second don't, don't judge others. He ends chapter one with this downward spir spiral of human depravity once they've disconnected from God. But those of us who walk with God now, we can forget where we came from. We can forget that it's a gift as though we earned something. And so we can become a little Pharisee. So, so the Holy Spirit opens chapter two with this, verses one through four. Therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, you gotta stop and see what you're there for. You gotta back up and see where we came from. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O oh man or woman, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God, <laughs> that first verse, isn't that so true? I mean, some, one of the most self-righteous places is in traffic. I just did it the other day. I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden, some jerk cuts me off, right? And you're like, oh, I mean, you're just thinking, ah, right? I know, you guys bless them in Jesus' name. But first, I have this other reaction. Then I might bless them in Jesus' name. But I was like, man, you just cut me off. Oh, that is so, I mean, you know, so you're thinking these thoughts, right? You just want to ram them. And then you like, oh, there's my accident. So you go, Aah! and you cut the person off right behind you. And now you're the jerk, right? Isn't that, that's the way life is. See, we judge others according to their actions, but we judge ourselves according to our, our intent. Well, what I meant to say was, what I meant to do was, I didn't mean to do that, but then we judge others according to their actions or their inactions. That's why the Holy Spirit says you're inexcusable because we and I do the same things that others do. In verse three, and do you think this, O man, that you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same thing, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Now, there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ regarding judgment. 
and the world helps us to be confused on this matter. There are three different words for judgment in the New Testament. Let's look at them. Number one is crema. That is used here. Crime, decision of innocence or guilt after an investigation. And then the word krino, another Greek word, which is the pronouncement of judgment. That is where Jesus says in Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged. This judgment means I, I condemn you as a human being because of your belief system, because of your actions. You're not living up to the Bible. And so, you know, we judge you. Like these signs that say God hates homosexuals. No, he doesn't. That's horrible. God, God's, God's love is trying to draw homosexuals, adulterers, greedy, jealous, haters. I mean, lust, right? Ungodly ambitions. I mean, all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what did this say in verse 4? Don't you, don't you, do you despise the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? So while you and I are judging and condemning others, God is trying to draw them to himself. So he's not going to be able to use those of us who are condemning people. But this might surprise you. The Bible does have a word, judgment, that says that you and I are to judge. And what does that mean? Well, the word judgment that we are to use is the word diacrino, diacrino. It is simply means decide between two or more choices, to make a distinction, to separate two components, to render a decision, and to evaluate carefully. You notice to condemn or pronounce judgment is not in that definition. This simply means to decide between two things. So, for example, this banana is a good banana. You see that? It's yellow. It's perfect. It's not green. It's not brown. It's just perfectly yellow. And it's firm. It's awesome. You can just break this thing open like this, and it's just right. That is so good. So that's a good banana. What's in here? Huh. What would you call this? Yeah. But before the banana bread happens, you go to grab a banana, and which one are you going to grab to eat? We would call this one ripe. We would call this one overripe. And in today's PC culture, we would say, how dare you judge that banana? That banana is just fine the way it is. Don't call that an overripe banana, but it is an overripe banana. You hate her! Don't judge the banana. And so when we can't call an overripe banana an overripe banana, we can't deal with reality, which means you can't have a conversation about anything because you're going to be called a judger, a hater of overripe bananas. No, no. All we're saying is we are calling an overripe banana an overripe banana and a ripe banana a ripe banana. That's all we're doing. We are defining reality. Love doesn't change the definition of things. Why? Because if you change the definition of things, you cannot offer hope. Jesus' definition of love was not to not call sin, sin. Jesus, read the Gospels. He pulled no punches. He called sin, sin. Then he died for it. And that's love. You and I are called by Jesus to be fruit inspectors. Jesus said, you will know them by their So if we can't call bad fruit bad fruit, then we're all lost. 
But the purpose for pointing out bad fruit isn't to condemn them. It's so God can make banana bread. Because that's what God does. He takes the most broken, lost, sinful, depraved person and transforms them into something wonderful. Like Bella does with the rotten bananas in our house. She transforms rotten bananas into amazing banana bread. And God transforms the worst sinner into his own righteousness. It is a gift. But if you don't call unrighteous unrighteous and immoral immoral and impure impure and sin sin, there's no hope you'll ever become banana bread. In fact, the Bible says, God says to his priests in the Old Testament, teach my people to discern between the holy and the unholy, the clean and the unclean. And when the priests didn't, God would remove them. Why? Because God wants his people healthy and whole and happy and peaceful. And sin destroys. So the first don't is don't be ashamed to share the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation. The second don't, don't judge others. That is not our place. There is one judge, and that's God Almighty, and he can judge whenever and however he wants. But you and I are not allowed to judge. And Jesus said, the measure that you use to judge others is going to come back and judge you. He also says, but they who show mercy will obtain mercy. So whenever you find yourself judging somebody else, just sm slip off the throne. Say, I'm sorry, God, I was judging. When you, when you have forgiven me, how could I be judging somebody else? And the third thing, the first are two don'ts. The last one is the do. And that's in chapter 3. After he goes down to chapter 2 saying don't judge, chapter 3 showing that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writes this, starting in verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that means the law of God written, the Ten Commandments, but also the law of our conscience that God has put inside of us. Romans chapter 1 talks about that. The law, the written law or the conscience, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, our good works, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The purpose of the law, the commandments, the do's and don'ts, is so you and I know what sin is so that we can escape it by coming to Christ. You see, self-righteousness will keep us out of heaven. If you and I think that we can get into heaven or have a relationship with God by our own good works, we are shut out because salvation is by grace and grace alone. So he goes on to say, but now, everybody say, but now. Yeah. Say it out loud, come on, but now. Yeah. The righteousness, that means right standing with God. The righteousness of God, apart from our good works, is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So, the do is do put your faith in Jesus alone. It doesn't matter how many good works you do, how many times you read the Bible, how many times you fast, how long you pray in other tongues, how many people you witness to, how long you praise until your head blows up. It doesn't matter. These are not works that will ever get us to be right with God. 
The only thing that gets us right with God is faith in his son. The way I come to God all the time, I still say this out loud. I've been doing it for years. I'm not coming to you this morning, Father, based on my righteousness. I'm coming to you based on the blood of Jesus and his righteousness that was accredited to me. That's how I come to you. Faith and the blood of Jesus. I'm coming on his righteousness, not mine. And I'm telling you, when you come by faith and the gift of righteousness, rather than your own good works, shame shuts up, guilt goes away, and you're in the presence of God immediately. You might not feel it, but you're there. Coming to the throne of grace. I'm telling you, you can access the throne of grace that fast when you come by Jesus' righteousness and not your own. It goes on to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely. This word justified means it's a, it's a uh, legal term from a courtroom in, uh, environment, which means acquitted or declared righteous. That's the, what the word justified means. I like to define it as justified, never done it. You and I are declared righteous only when we put all of our faith in Christ and Christ alone. Every day of our lives, every minute of every day of our lives, every breath we breathe is by faith in what Jesus did for us and Jesus alone. Then all the things that come out of that is a life of thanksgiving. And then all the good works you get rewarded for when you get to heaven. And this is a completely different message, which I'm not going to preach today, but let me just say this. If, if I have an, if, I, yeah, I do have many angsts, but here's one of my angsts. It's a big one. Ah, I wish I could get every believer and shake them like that. Say, listen to me. Judgment day is coming. Not for your sin, but for what you've done for Christ while you lived on the earth. It's a beaming seat of Christ. It's a reward ceremony. And when you get there, he sees every dollar you gave to his kingdom, every prayer that you prayed, every time you witnessed, every trial you went through and praised him anyway, every, every minute of faithfulness, he is recording and will be rewarding all of it. Don't you want him to look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Every day that you and I are not spending, putting the kingdom first, loving Jesus and serving him is a wasted opportunity to honor him with your works when you arrive. Some say, hey, I'm just happy just to show up. Not me, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm not gonna be at the reward ceremony and see Mark come up here and Jesus puts a crown on his head and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And then I'm coming up and Jesus is like, the blank pay, yeah. Okay, so I called you 30 years ago and... For me, it's about the way that we love God back. The way we honor Him is with our time, with our treasure, our talents, our passions, our focus, our lives. When I was a youth pastor, there was this young teenage gal. We went to a youth camp, and she went walking off into the, to the meadows and she came upon this little amphitheater, outdoor amphitheater, and she just sat there, and there was this huge wooden cross down at the bottom of the amphitheater. And as she was standing at the cross, she just had this revelation of what Jesus Christ did for her. And she just walked down the stairs of the amphitheater up to that cross, and she just started hugging the cross. And she said, Jesus how could I ever thank you? And he spoke back to her and said, by the way you live your life. 
Let's pray. Some of you are afraid to completely yield to Jesus 100%, but I'm going to tell you, it is the best decision you will ever make for your own soul, your life, and your eternal life. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now, just this moment, to completely lay it all down. Your own ambitions, planning out your own future, half-stepping with Jesus, which is the devil. The devil's got you. He's tricked you. Rebellion. Rebel against the devil. Don't rebel against God. Be a rebel for Jesus. Tell your flesh to shut up and quit dictating your life. Live by the Spirit of God, the life-giving Spirit. Trust Him. Lay it all down this morning. Give Jesus a chance. First thing that will happen is peace will flood your soul. You'll begin to hear the voice of God. You'll begin to live a life of fruitfulness and impact. You'll feel the joy of God. It all begins with submission to the King. And I'm going to ask you to do this as well. Would you dedicate yourself to the mission of Christ right now? The first thing Jesus said to his first disciples was, come follow me and I will teach you how to be fishers of men. That's what we did today. The last thing he said before he went to heaven was, go now. Share the gospel with everybody. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then I'm with you to the ends of the world. I'm going to ask you right now, As a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, would you commit to Jesus right now? I will never be ashamed of the gospel again. I will not be intimidated or afraid. Give me opportunities and I will share what I learned today and do the best I can to lead people to you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to come down to the pony wall here. And uh, in this church, we believe in miracles. We believe that Jesus is still healing, saving, and delivering. There's no demon possession stronger than Jesus. There's no sickness or disease stronger than Jesus. There's no oppression that he can't lift, no problem he can't solve, no soul he can't save. So as the prayer teams come down front, if you need prayer this morning, or if you want to give your life to Jesus, Just walk on down front here. They're going to pray with you. And uh, they are believing God for miracles today. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for coming to the gathering place today. We're going to have some fellowship out front. Go get your kids. Uh, Go to a connect group. And I'll see you next Sunday. God bless.